most of them, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. I'm almost a whole day old now. I arrived yesterday. I feel like an experiment. 
feel exactly like an experiment. It would be impossible for a person to feel more like an experiment than I do. And so I am coming to feel convinced that that is what I am. An experiment. Just an experiment and nothing more. I followed the other experiment around yesterday afternoon, at a distance, to see what it might be for if I could. But I was not able to figure it out. I wanted to know what he was writing in that thing that looked like a diary. This new creature with the long hair is a good deal in the way. <laughs> ah! I want you to know. <sighs> it is always hanging around and following me about. I don't like this. I am not used to comedy. I wish it would stay with the other animals. I just wanted to know. no more like a dog dog than I do. When the tree pointed that at him and I was faced with the task of meeting him, I thought very hard about the matter for a second or two. I even hesitated for a moment. But then I looked in his eye and I knew. A reptile! <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Here, upon the solemn hush 
of these dreaming solitudes offends my ear and then seems to fall asleep. So then I followed the cows around all day long and I didn't see them drinking anything of that color. Uh, interesting. Uh, I know. Hmm. When I found it could talk, I felt a new interest in it. For I love to talk. I talk all day, and in my sleep too, and I am very interesting. But if I had another to talk to, I could be twice as interesting, and would never stop with desire. And this new sound is so close to me, straight my shoulder, right at my ear. First on one side, and then on the other. And I am used only to sounds about more or less distant from me. always looking in the pond. She says she feels sorry for those creatures that live there and she calls fish. I think she's trying to catch them. Though she's using very unconventional means. She won't catch a thing. I doubt fish is their name anyway, because they never come when one calls them. No. 
splash. <laughs> I sat on a moss bank with my feet in the water. It's where I go when I'm under for companionship. Someone to look at, someone to talk to. It's not enough that lovely white body painted there in the pool, but it is something. Something is better than utter loneliness. It talks when I talk. It is sad when I am sad. It comforts me with its sympathy. It's a good friend to me. My only one. It is my sister. Oh, the first time she forsook me, I tapped the water. I reached in for her. I did everything I could for her to come back. I hid my face in my hands and there was no solace for me. I took them away after a little. There she was again. White and shining and beautiful, and I sprang into her arms. Splash! <laughs> she has taken up the snake. I am glad because the snake comes, and this allows me to get a rest. I can do now as I please. Because she barely puts up a fight anymore. Look! Dee, hey, you wanna come jump over the falls with me? No, thank you. Okie dokie. <laughs>
Sunday. Have to 
ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I give you the fat day in Eden. Fat.
to sleep to see me. It won't bother him anymore. Ever again, Eve. He's dead. He's deadly, deadly dead. He became the first tangible consequence of death in the world, changing his beings to human beings. The other child was cursed and banished into the dark, even beyond my reach. All this pain and suffering makes you wonder why, doesn't it? What did Adam and Eve do that was so terrible as to deserve this fate? We all know they did. They did not. A simple little apple. Did you know in fact it actually wasn't an apple? I mean, nobody knows exactly what it was, but someone painted an apple one day in a car. So he creates the most perfect garden with the most beautiful creatures, makes man and woman, gives them reason and free will, and says, everything you see is yours. All that exists is yours to do with it as you please, and you shall tender to it. All is yours, except for that tree. The big and shiny tree which you can't avoid seeing, and which fruit seems to be by far the best fruit in the garden. That glorious and most powerful tree that will call you in your dreams to come and taste its fruit from that tree, thou shalt not eat. For if you eat from it, you shall introduce death into the world and be expelled from Eden. <laughs> right. Like any kid in the universe would climb that tree and taste its fruit. Can you imagine? You take your child to the widest and best video collection and say, all that you see here, son, is yours to do with as you please, except for this one movie, which is the most amazing movie ever done in the history of all movies in which you are bound to love. I forbid you to see. But I'll leave it right here. On this low table right in front of you with a big red sign that reads, best movie ever, <laughs> which you can clearly see from any place in the room. Beware. For if you watch this movie, you shall bring Sharara <laughs> into the world. What the heck is Sharara, you might be asking? <laughs> well, your kid will be asking the same thing at first, and when he got tired of trying to figure it out, what do you think he'd do? He'd grab that movie, put it in the DVD player, and have the time of his life, and find out how bad Sharara was, except the kids. Rather than even, Sharara was dead. It was a setup. He meant for you to eat the fruit and become man and woman rather than boy and girl. Adam and Eve had no possibility of ever overcoming this task. The creator meant for you to eat the fruit, be crushed, brought down to the ground in a plea of mercy, dragging your body and finding joy in the tiny crumbs of happiness that sometimes falls in your life. Dog it. Mankind makes the best of it. This is how it happened. 
how you became. I was minding my business in the garden, which was pretty much the pride of Adam and Eve. Now we of the celestial realm could be seen by the original couple. Adam had already met with the archangels and with me too. At any rate, Adam decided to do one of the silly experiments, leaving people alone. I used this opportunity to have a conversation with her. I was curious as to how these two innocent creatures could ever overcome the never-ending food test. It was apparent that the whole affair was in their heads, for right away she asked me the meanings of the words good, evil, and death. Would I tell her? Certainly no could be more willing, but how was I to do it? I asked if she knew what pain was, she had not a clue. I explained to her that things which are outside our orbit are no particular world, things which by our constitution and our equipment we are unable to see, feel, or otherwise experience can be made comprehensible to us with words. There you have it. The whole thing in a nutshell, it is principle. It is axiomatic, it is law. I tried to explain these things to her, but she missed the point as she necessarily would. When I described death as a very, very long sleep, she just said, all the lovelier. I love to sleep. Nothing could be better than death. Poor child. She learned the hard way what a pathetic truth she had uttered in her innocent days. It was a hopeless case, but I was patient. For I knew that the command of refrain meant nothing to them. They were like children. I could not understand verbal abstraction and untried things. I simply said to understand the meanings of all the words they were vexed about. There was only one thing to do. That was to eat the fruit from that tree. Eve grab ya. Goodbye, Eden, and your sinless joys. Come poverty, pain, disease, hunger, thirst, cold, heartache, and bereavement, shame, tears, and envy, dishonor, age, weariness, remorse, hate, rebellion, and deceit. The weariness of the body and the spirit. The dreams which restore Eden and vanish it again with waking. Then the desperation and prayer for the release of death, indifferent that the gates of hell yawn beyond it. She tasted it. The fruit fell from her hand. It's pitiful. She was like one who awakened slow and confused out of a dream. She looked half vacantly at me then, at Adam. Then her glance fell upon her naked person as the red blood mounted to her cheeks. Adam's eyes were fixed upon her in a dreamy amazement, and how his wonder grew as Eve's 100 years rose upon him. Fate ahead in her eyes and tints of her young flesh. Touched her hair with gray and traced faint sprays of wrinkles around her mouth and eyes shrunk her form and dulled the satin lustre of her skin. Adam then loyally and bravely took the apple, tasted it, saying nothing. So I'm telling you, descendants of Adam and Eve, that you are meant to travel the road your own. You are meant to ask questions and go to the furthest extremes to find answers. You are meant to challenge everything around you and aspire to become gods, and in doing so, you are supposed to become good. Now even though you're supposed to, we all know the reality. We all know that the majority of you will end up with me. But don't fret. Hell is a fabulous place. I just opened a brand new five-star hotel with direct view into the lake of fire. There's no better way of suffering your measurable amounts of pain produced by thousands of degrees of temperature than staring out into the lake of fire. But I'll be waiting for you, for each and every one of you. Oh boy, what a party. No joke to sleep is
I'm going to go up north to try and grow some legs on the whales so we can leave that red blue ocean. And I ask you to come, but, well, you know, I'm going to be away for a few days and you're in no condition to travel. You should rest yes. until that uh, be loaded as passes.
I think I know what these things are now. Oh, yeah? They are an enigma. <laughs> <laughs> Or some kind of bug. <laughs> I tried kangaroos, bears, and parrots before they hit me. Kate came directly walking and asked, Adam, why are you always writing in that book? I write my thoughts, I replied. Why? He said. <laughs> Why? Well, because. Why? He repeated. <laughs> uh, so that I can read what I think or thought back when I wrote it. Why? <laughs> well, because many things leave your head and you have to give them something to find them. Why do things leave your head? He repeated again. Um, because memory is an unreliable human tool that tends to offer subjective and usually unconsciously edited versions of episodes that in many cases never even happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, keeping a written record can be pressured to read things back to a more accurate reproduction of those events. He kept silent for a few seconds, but then he started again. What? And then, it was as if the sun had come out inside me. I interrupted him mid-question. I know what you are now. You want to know? Taken aback, she replied incredulously. You know what I am? Yeah. What am I? <laughs> you are a boy. Not that far from a bug green. <laughs> well, that's that. Go up already. Come on, go chase something or something. And up he went, half crestfallen, half excited. Not every day you find out what you are. I am the warrior of God and I will destroy you with my sacred blade. Kids, kids, stop doing that. We're going to hurt each other. <laughs> <laughs> Kate came running to me with a bucket. I knew right away what the children were. Well, I was almost sure in any case. Because how could I know for sure what they were if we never had it? At the beginning, I only knew I had to protect them from Adam. I lived in constant fear of the next experiment. Whenever Adam was around the house and it was too quiet, I knew something was going on. I would frantically search for the deluded fool, most of the time arriving just in time to save Cain from catastrophe. How could I tell him, though? Could I even begin to explain what I knew in my heart was true when I had no evidence to prove it? Never mind telling him that the babies came from inside of me. No doubt he would have wanted to open me up to see. We had been expelled from paradise, and it had been hard. And eventually we built a little house not too far from where we had been thrown out. And we continued to live just as in Eden. We made love, something that was new and we both enjoyed. Then I started to get big, and neither of us knew what was going on. But the moment I heard Cain cry for the first time, I could not explain it, but I felt I loved that little thing more than anything else in the universe. And I somehow knew something terrible could happen to that little creature. The dark foreboding of pain beyond measure was with me like nothing I had known until then. When Abel came along, I told Adam, the experiments were over, or he would have to leave. He could not be worried about what he was doing with the kids all the time. And soon after, he gave the experiments up, though I could tell his curiosity had not been satisfied. And then, and then the other babies started to come. And for the life of us, we could not figure out where all of these babies were coming from. Every time I had to deliver, I would go into the woods so Adam did not see that the creatures came from inside of me. I thought he would soon connect the dots. I got big, I went into the woods, I came back thinner, and with a newborn. However, <laughs> thanks to God, he was so thick he didn't make any connection until the sixth child. 
child. And even then he said, well, I don't know where all of these creatures are coming from, but at least we know every time you go and hunt them, it fixes your bee loadedness. <laughs> Poor little stupid man. <laughs> you should have seen his face the day he figured it out. So full of pride for discovering the obvious. You should have seen his face too, when I not only told him that I had known all along, but that the babies came from inside of me every time I got really big. And then he wanted to see where the babies came out from. And then he would not believe it, saying it is scientifically impossible for something the size of a baby to come out of something the size of your... <laughs> Get the picture. He eventually came to understand this is the truth as well. But, for all of my sharp reasoning, and inherent knowledge, nothing could have prepared me for Adam for what was coming. We would soon feel the real consequence of being expelled from Eden. That dark foreboding that never left me showed itself when I least expected it. I found me. Unmoving on the ground. Simple little crew with no simple little action. 
Russia. He created an entire new universe. Well, certainly full of pain and misery and many other terrible things, but one also full of joy and beauty and magic. It suddenly struck me that there were millions of my children walking the earth, building communities, helping each other. And even though I would still remember Eden, I'll forget it. They couldn't. And so they could find unhappiness in using it. I began to believe that Abel's death had not been in vain, that he became a sort of a sacrificed his cause. He died and was taken away. But I could still feel his fire burning in the souls of his millions of siblings and, and Cain's too, and I was glad. Because even though the first two were the necessary sacrifice, they were also the dearest to me, and I miss them terribly. Slowly, I started to find happiness again. There was hope as my children demonstrated that they could rebuild him. <laughs> Only in a, in a human, imperfect shape. And as the veil of self-pity was lifted from my eyes, I could see that not only had they inherited the worst of my first two sons, but they had also inherited the best of them. Their abilities to, to love, to choose, and, and that indescribable, tenacious, stubborn will to live. Despite disease, pain, death, despite wars, and murders, and, and evils that sweep away nations, my children are still here, still standing, still able to make a choice. And if only they make the right one, oh, welcome to paradise. And so, I came at last to a place of peace. I grieve the losses that Adam and I suffered, but I also rejoice in the many good things that came with them. Once again, there's hope as my children show what they're capable of. And so I'm able to sit with Adam and rejoice as we look up at the stars. I still wish I could get some to put in my hair. To think that this multitude is but a small little fraction of the Earth's population, and all but relatives to be everyone. This thought excites Eve's affectionate heart. She could never keep her composure when she'd come upon her relative. She'd try to kiss every one of these people, black and white, yellow and red, and all that she had in her way. face to face 
down a procession 300,000 years long and remain the same without shade of change. Can you believe this? Look, okay. So they say it's true, but really? <laughs> it is indeed difficult to tell fact from fiction these days. Where are you from? <laughs> Take a guess. See how close you can get. Really? Oh, okay. If I guess right, will you tell me? Oh, yes. Cross your heart and hope to die? Cross my heart and hope to die? What's that? Oh, that's funny. I know one thing for sure. What's that? Well, you're not from around here, and you aren't, are you? No, I'm not. I cross my heart and hope to die, as you say. I figure I'm not always smart, but that's smart. Well. Well, not so very, because, well, I already believe you were a foreigner from a different sign. What's that? Your accent. You just speak too proper. I said to myself, now, two to one, he's a foreigner, and ten to one, he's English, and that is your nationality, isn't it? Ah, uh, you'll have to guess again. Really? You are not an Englishman? No, no. Cross my heart and hope to die. Well, I guess you don't look like an Englishman. Well, the fact is, you don't, you don't look quite like anyone I've ever seen before. I, I'm going to get some more. Wales, Scotland, okay. Ireland, okay. Finland, Denmark, um, Lithuania, Turkey, Latvia, Estonia, Bulgaria, Belarus, Argentina, Colombia, Brazil. The state? No! <laughs> Bye now. Bye. 